When I was diagnosed with pattern hair loss 14 years ago, I wanted to do something, but I was also overwhelmed by so much conflicting advice online, particularly when it came to picking the right DHT reducer. Coconut oil, onions, turmeric, pumpkin seeds, edamame, extracts like green tea, saw palmetto, reishi mushroom, EGCG, crocopil, and then there are the pharmaceuticals, spironol, ketoconazole. What's effective? What's dangerous? Could some DHT blockers make my hair loss worse? Well, today, as a medical editor and a peer-reviewed researcher specializing in hair loss disorders, I'm making this video to help navigate to the facts, not fiction, about DHT blockers. Which ones work, which ones don't, ranked from worst to best. That's all coming up. Hi, this is Rob English from Perfect Hair Health, and in today's video, we are going to be diving into six DHT blockers ranked from worst to best. But first, what is DHT? Well, DHT is short for dihydrotestosterone, which is a hormone that's made from testosterone. It also happens to be the main hormone implicated in pattern hair loss, one of the world's most common hair loss disorders. Now, this video is not going to dive into the nuances of the DHT pattern hair loss connection. That's for a later video. For now, all we need to know is that studies show that one, DHT is elevated in balding scalps, two, men who can't produce DHT never go bald, three, human hair follicle dermopapillae cell clusters, when exposed to DHT, undergo cell death and miniaturization, and four, by reducing DHT levels in the scalp, many men can stop the progression of pattern hair loss, hair follicle miniaturization, and even regrow a little hair. Needless to say, if we want to fight pattern hair loss effectively, we should at a minimum consider lowering DHT. But herein lies the problem. DHT isn't just a hormone linked to hair loss. It's also a hormone that is critical for the early stages of male development. Moreover, in adulthood, DHT seems to be protective against high estrogen levels. As such, men who lower their DHT levels will sometimes report some side effects, a few of which are low libido, weak erections, brain fog, and even gynecomastia, also known as the growth of male breast tissue. Again, stuff that we would rather avoid. That's why when picking a DHT blocker, we have to weight its power against its safety. In other words, for any DHT reducer, what can we expect in terms of hair density increases versus the increased risk of side effects? So for this video, we've chosen to rank six DHT reducers from the perspective of lowest clinical efficacy and highest safety profile, all the way to highest clinical efficacy and lowest safety profile. And we're gonna move fast because there is a lot to cover. And by the way, if after watching this video, you're still feeling uncertain about DHT reducers, which ones to take, which ones to avoid, which ones are the right choices for your specific hair loss situation, visit perfecthairhealth.com and check out our membership community. This is where you can interact one-on-one -on -one with me, engage with our research team, join our weekly live calls, and start a path toward hair regrowth on your terms, with the drug model or without the drug model. First up on our list of DHT reducers, saw palmetto. Saw palmetto, a palm plant grown in the southeastern US, happens to be one of the most popular herbal DHT reducers on the market, and not without reason. In one clinical study lasting two years, saw palmetto was shown to stop pattern hair loss in 90% of men taking the supplement. Other studies have shown a bit of regrowth when combining saw palmetto as a supplement and as a topical alongside a few other ingredients. Now, just to preface, my experience working with people suggests that saw palmetto by itself is not an effective standalone treatment, but it's better than doing nothing. And overall, the studies show that this supplement, well, it's relatively safe, even over five year time horizons. For example, this meta-analysis examined 14 randomized placebo-controlled studies that had reported adverse events and found that saw palmetto's risk of side effects was small, comparable to the placebo groups, that's the sugar pill group, 
And even when events did occur, they were mainly relegated to things like upset stomachs or headaches after taking the supplement on an empty stomach. Better yet, this study saw no concerning changes to blood work, with the majority of side effects reported in the placebo group, or in other words, people who weren't even taking saw palmetto in the first place. Lastly, out of thousands of participants in studies taking saw palmetto, only a tiny, tiny number have ever reported minor reductions to libido, suggesting that the risk of sexual side effects from saw palmetto is much, much less than 1%. Taken together, this puts saw palmetto first on our list of DHT reducers. It's got relatively low efficacy, okay, but it's got a high safety profile, and it's natural, which matters for some degree of people. And it still does something. In other words, it appears very safe and it might help to slow down or stop pattern hair loss's progression. But again, don't expect any miracles. Now, if you're going to take saw palmetto for hair loss, there's a few quick things you might want to think about. First, take 320 milligrams of saw palmetto extract daily. According to the evidence so far, effective dosages seem to range from 200 milligrams all the way up to 320 milligrams daily, depending on the extraction method used. Second, consider splitting your dosages up throughout the day. The volatile acids inside saw palmetto, well, they have relatively short half-lives. That means that they don't act for very long in scalp tissue and in prostate tissue. So it's probably best to split up that 320 milligram daily dosage to half in the morning and half at night. And third, combine saw palmetto with ingredients to enhance its absorption and potentially its efficacy, specifically beta-cetosterol, lecithin, inositol, phosphatidylcholine, and perhaps even niacin and biotin. And we have more recommendations for saw palmetto, especially on which brands of saw palmetto to avoid. But again, this is gonna be for a later video dedicated to just this topic alone. Next up on our list of DHT reducers, ketoconazole shampoo. Ketoconazole shampoo is an antifungal medication. It's used to treat skin conditions like dandruff and seborrheic dermatitis and even jock itch, but when it's formulated as a shampoo, there's some evidence that it can improve hair counts, increase hair diameters, and potentially even lower scalp DHT levels, which is what we want, and all without really impacting hormone levels elsewhere in the body. In fact, Studies show that 2% ketoconazole shampoo, when used properly, seems to boast an 80% response rate with average hair density increases of around 5%. Again, this is no miracle shampoo, but with just 1-7% to of people reporting side effects ranging from things like scalp itchiness all the way to scalp dryness, I like to think of ketoconazole as sort of like a low-cost, low-effort, sort of effective hair loss intervention. Again, not a standalone, but it's something. So two quick notes for those who want to try ketoconazole shampoo. The first, and this is really important, you have to get the 2% formulation. You can find the 1% variety in most grocery and drug stores, and yet this dilution isn't clinically effective at fighting hair loss. It's only effective at fighting dandruff. That means if you want to see an effect, go and get a prescription for the higher formulation. Secondly, use as directed. In most cases, that means a usage frequency of about two to four times weekly with scalp contact time of about five to 10 minutes. Failure to do this might result in you wasting a lot of money on the shampoo and wondering why things aren't getting better. Next up on our list of DHT reducers, combinations of natural plus herbal DHT reducers. Now, you've probably heard that saw palmetto isn't the only natural DHT reducer out there. And technically, that is true. There are studies showing that in cell cultures, other substances and herbal extracts can also inhibit 5-alpha reductase. That's the enzyme that converts free testosterone into DHT. And in doing so, these compounds can potentially lower DHT levels in humans. So a few of them are things like astaxanthin, azaleic acid, reishi mushroom extract, lycopene, green tea extract, beta-cetosterol, alpha-linolenic acid, zinc, curcumin, pumpkin seed oil, and a million other things. And the thought here is that maybe if we can combine these things all together, well, maybe that will have more of a DHT-reducing effect than saw palmetto alone. And then maybe that'll have a better effect on our hair. Now, 
I get the logic behind this, but in the realities of biology, taking more of something doesn't always mean that you'll see more improvements, especially when things you're taking all tend to target that same pathway for DHT reduction, which in this case is 5-alpha reductase inhibition. For instance, in this study, Taking three times the daily dose of saw palmetto for an entire year did not lead to three times better improvements to enlarged prostate symptoms. Rather, it led to the same improvements as the single standard 320 milligram daily dose. Similarly, this study showed that megadosing saw palmetto and astaxanthin together did not reduce blood levels of DHT any better than a small amount of saw palmetto and astaxanthin. And so, Knowing this, when you look at the clinical data on supplements like, let's say, Nutrafol, which combines many natural potential DHT reducers into one big pill, well, the hair regrowth that these people see in studies, it isn't really any more effective or impressive than what we'd expect from a typical dose of 320 milligrams of saw palmetto alone. Which begs the question, why am I putting combination natural and herbal extracts for DHT reduction above both saw palmetto and ketoconazole? And the answer is, I don't have a good answer for this. I, I really don't. I kind of see all of these three options as similar in efficacy. They're not home runs here. They're just something that starts the process of DHT reduction. But for these herbal combinations where they differ, it's probably not so much in efficacy. My guess is that it's way more in safety because a lot of these extracts that I just mentioned, there are very few long-term studies evaluating their safety profiles, particularly at the mega dosages featured in best-selling Amazon supplements. Adding in all these extra natural DHT reducing herbs it might have some additional effect on lowering DHT, but you have to be very selective in how you go about doing this. And that tiny additional improvement that you might see to your hair from these things, in most cases, it's not gonna be worth the massively higher costs that you're incurring on a monthly basis or the unknown safety risks versus just taking saw palmetto alone. Again, that's just my opinion. Okay, moving away from herbs. We are now entering into pharmaceutical territory. Next up on our list of DHT reducers, topical finasteride. So it goes without saying that for men, finasteride is considered the gold standard treatment for pattern hair loss. This is because studies show that this drug can stop pattern hair loss in 80 to 90% of men trying it, it can increase hair counts by about 10%, and it thickens miniaturizing hair, which all in often equates to 20 to 30% improvements to overall hair density. That is a massive amount for people at the early stages of hair loss. And the drug does this by inhibiting an enzyme called type 2,5-alpha reductase, which helps to lower DHT levels by about 60 to 70%. The problem is that oral finasteride reduces DHT levels everywhere, and not just in the scalp where we want them to go down. In other words, it's a systemic DHT reducer, and it's this systemic lowering of DHT that some people online use as a surrogate to predict as a risk for their side effects. So people often ask, what if we could just localize finasteride's effects to just our scalps? Well, that's what topical finasteride attempts to do. It formulates oral finasteride as a topical, so you can apply the medication directly to your scalp and hopefully reduce its risks of going systemic. So does this actually work to reduce side effects and improve hair counts? Yes, to a degree. Studies suggest that topical finasteride at a 1% formulation is considered non-inferior, also known as equivalent to one milligram of oral finasteride tablets in terms of hair regrowth. But concentrations as low as 0.005% have been shown to improve hair in men with pattern hair loss. So what about the systemic absorption part? Well, this is where things get a little more complicated with topical finasteride. There are studies showing that topical finasteride at a 0.25% dilution, it can reduce scalp DHT by 24 to 75%, depending on the amount applied. And while larger applications reduce more scalp DHT, they also appear to have systemic effects, meaning that you basically get the same effect as if you were taking the oral medication. And this is because finasteride has what's known as a dose-dependent logarithmic effect on DHT reduction. In other words, just a tiny amount of this drug 
if it reaches the bloodstream, it reduces just as much DHT as a dose that is 25 times higher. That's important because depending on the percent of topical finasteride you're applying and the amount that you're spreading across your scalp, you might actually be exposing your body to more of the drug than if you were taking one milligram of finasteride orally. For instance, by applying one milliliter per day of a 0.25% topical finasteride solution, that means you're actually applying roughly 2.5 milligrams of finasteride to your scalp. Well, a typical oral dose is one milligram, so that's 2.5 fold more finasteride exposure each day than the typical oral dosage. And again, all it takes is just 0.2 milligrams of that dose to enter the bloodstream for you to achieve that same systemic DHT lowering effect everywhere as the oral medication. So think about this before you jump to it. In any case, many clinicians estimate that topical finasteride is roughly as effective as oral finasteride, but that it only reduces your risk of side effects by about 30 to 50% compared to the oral drug. There actually might be ways to lower that risk even further, potentially by changing the delivery vehicle of topical finasteride. For instance, using things like cyclodextrins, chitosans, or even liposomes. But again, that's more for a later video dedicated to this topic. Next up on our list of DHT reducers, you guessed it, oral finasteride. Compared to topical finasteride, oral finasteride confers unique advantages. For example, it's easier to use, it affects all of your hair follicles rather than just the ones where you apply it, and it's got better clinical data supporting it. Across hundreds of studies and tens of thousands of study participants, finasteride has demonstrated consistently impressive hair growth outcomes and a relatively decent safety profile. Better yet, the drug seems much more effective than its herbal alternatives, with this head-to-head -head study demonstrating significantly better hair growth outcomes over two years with finasteride versus saw palmetto alone. It's this data that firmly cements finasteride as one of the more powerful DHT reducers on our list. And again, I know that the risk of side effects is debated with finasteride. We will have another video about this topic, so stay tuned. Last on our list is oral dutasteride. For those looking for an even greater DHT reducing effect, consider trying oral dutasteride. This is a medication that inhibits both type 1 and type 2 5-alpha reductase, and it's prescribed off-label for those looking to treat pattern hair loss at the highest level. Depending on the dose, dutasteride can reduce DHT levels by up to 95% while still preserving testosterone. This makes it slightly more powerful than finasteride, with short-term studies showing that 0.5 to 2.5 milligrams can regrow hair two to five times faster than finasteride alone. And this even leads to more robust increases in hair counts, which is really, really nice for people who are looking for the biggest effect possible. Now, interestingly, this meta-analysis showed that when used as a hair loss treatment, dutasteride's risk of side effects was actually comparable to finasteride, even despite lowering more DHT. Having said that, we also know that the risk of certain side effects, things like gynecomastia, it increases with dutasteride versus finasteride. So, while it's more effective, it also may come with a slightly higher risk of side effects. And that is it. That is our list of DHT reducers ranked from worst to best in terms of clinical efficacy and safety, all the way up to the best clinical efficacy and lowest safety profiles. And before we wrap this up, just a few quick things. First, the only scientifically honest way to compare effectiveness and side effect profiles across DHT reducers, well, it's to test them within the same study. This is because patient populations, hair count methodologies, side effect questionnaires, these things all vary across study groups. And that makes crude comparisons across two random hair loss studies, well, it makes it a little bit dishonest and really hard to do. So we did our best to line up methodologies in our analysis here, but since a large single study comparing all of these DHT reducers does not yet exist, we can't claim that this analysis is picture perfect. Second, it's important to keep in mind that even in the absolutes, everything that we just mentioned, all the way from saw palmetto to dutasteride, these things are relatively safe. 
I mean, finasteride and dutasteride are taken by millions of men every day, most of whom report no issues whatsoever. So don't let these relative comparisons that we've made scare you away from trying the more powerful pharmaceuticals, at least to see if you tolerate them well. If you don't, that's fine. You can hop off and try something else. Third, I know we left out a few DHT reducers that you probably wanted to hear about. For example, topical dutasteride, RU58841, Procopil, and a bunch of others. Well, we did this on purpose. Most of these treatments have too few studies, too much reliance on experimental data, too many unpublished clinical trials, that's a very bad sign, and all of these things make it really hard for us to really establish efficacy and safety profiles. We're aware of this and we'll be covering these topics in a later video. And before we go, if you're fighting hair loss and you want to begin a path toward hair regrowth, check out our membership community. This is where we create tailored regrowth regimens built around somebody's needs and preferences. And it's this hyper-specific, hyper-personalized approach that allows us to achieve results like this, or this, or this, or this, even without prescription drugs. And that's it. Stick around next week because we are going to spend the next few videos diving into a beginner's guide to fighting hair loss, the nuances of the DHT pattern hair loss connection, mechanisms you can target to improve hair loss outside of DHT, and believe me, there are a lot and so much more. Click the link to subscribe for future updates, and if you have any questions, you can reach out in the comments. Thank you.